Hello and uh, welcome to another video. Just in the camera so that you can at least see me speak. Um, I'm here on my big armchair and I wanted to share with you two books that I got over the weekend I I've, uh, I like as you know I like thrift stores and I go to thrift stores for pretty much everything that is um, kind of non-perishable and uh, specifically books clothes kitchen stuff, other items, and I bought some yarn at this thrift shop, uh, it's called Halo Animal Sanctuary or Rescue, I believe, thrift shop, and it's, if you are ever visiting Phoenix, it's uh, a great thrift shop very inexpensive and all the proceeds go to the animal shelter and it's very cute lots of interesting items so highly recommended halo animal rescue thrift shop in phoenix so i got these two books this one, The Dog Went Over the Mountain, Travels with Albie, An American Journey by Peter Jutlin. Um, and it's a story about a 65-year-old man and his rescue dog traveling across the country, meeting people. And he traveled 9,000 miles with Albie, his dog. So, and there are a couple of, couple of other books listed here as a recommendation. But I haven't started reading it yet. But... It has pictures of his dog right here. And their travels together. So it's kind of interesting. Oof. Reminds me somewhat of my lifestyle. Just travel in the country. So I wanted to get that. And this was a dollar. And then the second book is this one. It's a treasury of great cat stories. You all know that I'm a huge fan of cats. And I love everything about cats. I think if I could, I would be, maybe I still might be, a cat lady. But... For now, you know, I only have kitty. So anyway, I got this. This book is a combination, kind of a collection of cat stories by famous writers. They list some of the writers here. Kipling, Paul Gallico, Edgar Allan Poe, So, I decided I wanted it. It was uh, released. It was copyrighted in 1987 by the author Roger, Roger Harris. And this book was published in 1990. 
this notebook. So he has an introduction here. And here, to see, he was talking about just generally introducing the the stories. And the first story is by Kipling. I used to love him as a kid. And these are shorter stories. And. like a couple pages maybe maybe longer some of them are a bit longer but they're all about cats so let's see By the Fire by Lear Hunt. And we have The White Cat by Jacobs. Maybe The Cat by the Fire is what we're going to read. What do you think? All right. A blazing fire, a warm rug, candles lit and curtains drawn, the kettle on for tea, nor do the first circles despise the preference of a kettle to an urn, as the third or fourth may do, and finally the cat before you attracting your attention. It is a scene which everybody likes unless he has a morbid aversion to cats, which is not common. There are some nice inquirers, it is true, who are apt to make uneasy comparisons of cats to dogs, to say they are not so loving, that they prefer the house to the man, etc. But agreeably, to the good old maxim that comparisons are odious. Our readers, we hope, will continue to like what is likable in anything for its own sake, without trying to render it unlikable from its inferiority or something else to something else. A process by which we might ingeniously contrive to put suit into every dish that is set before us and to reject one thing after another till we were pleased with nothing. Here is a good fireside and a cat to it, and it would be our own fault if, in removing to another house and another fireside, we did not take care that the cat removed with us. Cats cannot look to the moving of goods as men do. If we would have creatures considerate toward us, we must be so toward them. It is not to be expected of everybody quadrupled or bibed that they should stick to us. In spite of our want of merit like a dog or a benevolent sage. Besides, stories have been told of cats very much to the credit of their benignity, such as their following a master bot like a dog waiting at a gentleman's door to thank him for some obligation overnight, etc. And our readers
others may remember the history of the famous Gadolfin Arabian, who's, upon whose grave a cat that had lived with him in the stable went and stretched itself and died. The cat purrs as if it applauded our consideration and great and gently moves its tail. What an odd expression of the power to be irritable and the will to be pleased there is in its face as it looks up at us. We must own that we do not prefer a cat in the act of purring or of looking in that manner. It reminds us of the sort of smile or simmer, simpler is too weak and fleeting a word, that it is apt to be in the faces of irritable people when they're pleased to be in the state of satisfaction. We prefer for a general expression the cat in a quiet, unpretending state and the human countenance with a look indicative or habitual of habitual grace and composure. And if it were not necessary to take any violent steps to prove its amiability, the smile without a smile as the poet beautifully calls it. Furthermore, in order to get rid at once of all that may be objected to poor pussy as boys at school get down their bad dumpling as fast as possible before the meat comes. We own we have an objection to the way in which a cat sports with a mouth before she kills it tossing and jerking it about like a ball and letting it go in order to pounce upon it with greater relish. And yet, what right have we to apply human measures of cruelty to the inferior reflectability of a cat? Perhaps she has no idea of the mouse's being alive in the sense that we have. Most likely she looks upon it as a pleasant, movable toy, made to be eaten, a sort of lively pudding that oddly jumps hither and thither. It would be hard to beat into the head of a country squire of an old class that there is any cruelty in hunting a hare and most assuredly it would be still harder to beat mouse sparing into the head head of a cat you might read the most pungent essay on the subject into her ear and she would only sneeze at it as to the unnatural cruelties which we sometimes read of committed by cats upon their offspring there are there are they are exceptions to the common and beautiful rules of nature and accordingly we have nothing to do with them they are traceable to some unnatural circumstances of breeding or of position enormities are monstrous as monstrous that are to be found among human beings and argue nothing against the general character of the species. Even dogs are not always immaculate and sages have made slips. Dr. Frank Franklin cut off his son with a shilling for differing him in politics. But cats resemble tigers? Are they are tigers in miniature? Well, and very pretty miniatures they are. And what has the tiger himself done?
that he has not arrived to eat his dinner as well as Jones. A tiger treats a man much as a cat does a mouse, granted. But we have no reason to suppose that he is aware of the man's sufferings or means anything but to satisfy his hunger. And what have the butcher and poulterer have been about meanwhile? The tiger, it is true, lays about him a little superfluously sometimes when he gets into a sheepfold and kills more than he eats, but does not require a squirrel or the Marqu Marquis, Marquis do pretty much like him in the month of September. Nay, we do not hear of a venerable judges that would not hurt a fly doing going about in that refreshing month seeking whom they may lame see the effect of habit and education and you can educate the tiger in no other way than by attending to his stomach Fill that and he will want no man to eat, probably not even to lame. On the other hand, deprive Jones of his dinner for a day or two and see what a state he will be in, especially if he is by nature erasable. There are a lot of words that are new to me here in this book. Nay, keep him from it for half an hour and observe the tiger propensities of his stomach and fingers. How worthy of killing he thinks the cook and what boxes of the ear he feels inclined to give the, give the foot boy. Animals, by the nature of things in their present state, dispose of one another into their respective stomachs without ill will on any side. They keep down the several populations of their neighbors till time may come when superfluous population of any kind need not exist and predatory appearances may vanish from the earth, as the wolves have done from England. But whether they may or not is not a question by a hundred times so important to moral inquirers as into the possibilities of human education and the nonsense of ill will. Show the nonentity of that and we may all get our dinners as jovially as we can sure of these three undoubted facts that life is long death short and the world beautiful and so we bring our thoughts back again to the fireside and look at the cat poor pussy she looks up at us again, as if she thanked us for those vindications of dinner, and symbolically gives a twist of a yawn and a lick to her whiskers. Now she proceeds to clean herself all over, having just the sense of the demands of her elegant person, beginning judiciously with her paws and fetching amazing tongues at the hind hips. In on, she scratches her neck with a foot of rapid delight, leaning her head toward it and shutting her eyes, half to accommodate the action of the skin and half to enjoy the luxury. She's, she then rewards her paws with a few more touches. Look at 
the action of her head and neck, how pleasing it is. The ears pointed forward and the neck gently arching to and fro. Finally, she gives a sneeze and another twist of mouth and whiskers, and then curling her tail toward her front claws, settles herself on her hindquarters in an attitude of land meditation. What does she think of? Of her saucer of milk at breakfast? Or of the thumb she got yesterday in the kitchen for stealing the meat? Or of her own meat, the tartar dish, noble horse flesh? Or of her friend, the cat next door? The most impassioned or of serenaders or of her little ones some of whom are now large and all of them gone is that among her recollections when she looks pensive does she taste of the noble prerogative sorrows of man she's a springly she's a yes she's a spring Brightly cat, not springly, hardly past her youth. So happening to move the fringe of the rug a little with her foot, she darts out a paw and begins plucking it and inquiring into the matter as if that it were a challenge to play or something lively enough to be eaten. What a graceful action of that foot of hers between delicacy and petulance, combining something of a thrust out, a beat, and a scratch. There seems even something of a little bit of fear in it, as if just enough to provoke her courage and give her the excitement of a sense of hazard. We remember being much amused with seeing a kitten manifestly making a series of experiments upon the patient of its mother, trying how far the latter would put up with positive bites and thumps. The kitten ran at her every moment, gave her a knock or a bite of the tail, and ran, ran back again to recommence the assault. The mother sat looking at her as if betwixt tolerance and admiration to see how far the sprint of the family was inherited or improved by her sprightly offspring. At length, however, the little pickle presumed too far, and the mother, lifting up her paw and meeting her at the very nick of the moment, gave her one of the most unsophisticated boxes of the ear we ever beheld. It sent her rolling half over the room and made her come to a most ludicrous pause with the oldest little look of premature and wincing meditation. The lapping of the milk out of the saucer is what once human thirst cannot sympathize with. It seems as if there could be no satisfaction in such a series of atoms of drink. Yet the saucer is soon emptied and there is a refreshment to one's ears in that sound of flashing with which the action of is accompanied and which seems indicative of a like comfort to puss's mouth. Her tongue is thin and can make a spoon of itself. This, however, is common to other quadrupeds, quadrupeds with the cat and does not therefore more particularly belong to our feline consideration.
Not so the electricity of its coat, which gives out sparks under the hand. Its passion for the herb valerian. Did the reader ever see one roll in it? It's a mad sight. If you guys haven't given your cat valerian, give it a shot. And other singular delicacies of nature, among which perhaps is to be reckoned its taste for fish. A creature with whose element it has so little to do that it's supposed even to abhor it. Though lately we read somewhere of a swimming cat that used to fish for itself. And this reminds us of an exquisite anecdote of dear, dogmatic, diseased, thoughtful, surely charitable Johnson who would go out of the doors himself and buy oysters for his cat because his black servant was too proud to do it. Not that we condemn the black in those enslaving, unliberating days. days. We had a right to the mistake. He had a right, that right to the mistake, though we should have thought better of him had he seen further and subjected his pride to affection for such a master. But Johnson's true practical delicacy in the manner in the matter is beautiful. Be assured that he thought nothing of condensation condescension, not condensation, condescension in it, or of being eccentric. He was singular in some things because he could not help it. But he hated eccentricity. No, in his best moments he felt himself simply to be a man, and a good man too, through a frail, one that in virtue as well as humility, and in the knowledge of his ignorance as well as his freedom, was desirous of being a Christian philosopher. And accidentally he went out and bought food for his hungry cat because his poor negro was too proud to do that and there was nobody else in the way whom he had a right to ask what must anybody that saw him would have thought as he turned up the bold court he but doubtless he went as secretly as possible that is to say, if consider the, the thing at all, his friend Gary could not have done as much. He was too grand and on a great stage of life. Goldsmith could, but he would hardly have thought of it. Beauclerk might, but he would have thought it necessary to excuse it with a jest or a wager or some such thing. Sir Joshua Reynolds with his fashionable fine lady painting hand would certainly have shrunk from it. Burke would have reasoned himself into its propriety, but he would have reasoned himself out again. Gibbon. Imagine its being put in the head of Gibbon. He and his bagwig would have started with all the horror of a gentleman usher and he would have rung the bell for the cook's deputies under assistant errand boy. Cats at firesides live luxuriously and are the picture of comfort, but lest they should not bear their portion of the trouble in this world, they have the drawbacks of being liable to be shut out of the doors on cold nights, beatings from the aggravated cooks, all the pettings of children, how should we like to be squeezed and pulled about in that manner by some great patronizing giants? And last, not least, horrible, merciless tramples of unconscious human feet and unfeeling legs of chairs, elegance, comfort, and security seem to order of the seemed the order of the day on all sides and you are going to sit down to dinner 
or to music or take tea. And when all of a sudden the cat gives a squall as if she were mashed. And you are not sure that the fact is otherwise. Yet she gets in the way again as before and dares all the feet and the mahogany in the room. Beautiful, present, su present sufficingness. Sufficiness? I don't know that word. Oh, anyway, the cat being sufficient imagination um confined to the snug circle of her own size and the two next inches of rug or carpet wow that was one heck of a story you can tell how when it was written how long ago it was written some of the words that they used and language, I mean, you could see me struggle pronouncing some of these words. Um, so, I hope you enjoyed it and it was relaxing. And I hope you have a wonderful day and have cats in mind. Speaking of cats, if you are interesting to donate to a cat rescue group um, you can donate to golden paw society it's a rescue that i volunteered for when i lived back in new york golden paw society really great rescue they rescued just cats and if you're in phoenix shop at the thrift shop a halo animal rescue thrift shop take care of yourself and goodbye till next time.